Welcome to Creative AI Conversations with me, Leah Coleman. In this interview series, we'll be chatting with prominent machine learning researchers and artists on their perspectives on Creative AI. So my, my name is David Ha. Uh, I work at uh, Google as a research scientist, and I'm currently based in uh, Tokyo, Japan. I worked uh, a bit in the finance industry as a, as a derivatives trader. Uh, but after a while, I kind of got bored about that and, and started to read up on neural networks, machine learning, because uh, I studied uh, control systems in school. And uh, eventually, uh, I decided to apply to work at Google Brain, uh, because a few years ago, they had, a, they had a brain residency program. And luckily, I got in and was able to, to spend some time uh, learning how to conduct scientific research in this area. And, and eventually I, I was able to uh, transfer from to, to Tokyo to start a small research team here where I'm based now. Like, could you talk a little bit about that? I think that like ties in with the end of your intro of like evolution and like how intelligence actually evolves out of, out of nothing. One of the theories that I like to think about is uh, information theory. Uh, how, for for instance, uh, compression or how to create a minimum description length of of something constitutes uh, constitutes something intelligence. How like uh, maybe we as a species as a whole, uh, we don't really follow the rules of entropy, so to speak, because we're able to to create things to to move things against the tide. This sort of uh, aspect of, of us in terms of the entropy expansion is related to our ability to develop, uh, or compress information. Maybe we can communicate lots of information about every aspect, but we may not be able to communicate the, the essence of what we want to talk about. Uh, there's also some form of constraints or limitations, like there's minimalistic arts uh there there's like the medium that artists use to to create their works and i think this sort of a constraints leads to uh leads to works that are appreciated by us i forget who said it but there's some famous saying about like i don't know like scarcity is the mother of innovation or something like that the minimum length or like to describe something because that is like a constraint like if you have limited bandwidth to describe something that like you need to find order in a way to like compress it all to like convey these patterns to someone else. Yeah, exactly. I think at the meta level as well, uh, we noticed that uh, I noticed there's a lot of uh, experimental evidence that suggests that constraints leads to creativity. Like, like some of the interests I have is looking at how optimization algorithms are able to come up with these solutions of problems that we didn't expect. What are your thoughts on, on those solutions that are like sort of surprising and novel? Do you think that, for example, that AI is like being creative or like what does that mean in that sense? For something, you know, whether it's an artwork or whether it's actually creating a, a engineering solution to tackle some problem, uh, we, we do require uh, ultimately uh, collaboration between uh, between a human designer, like an artist or an engineer uh, with with the optimization uh, search algorithm to to find kind of uh, what's best. The optimization algorithm it is it's just an algorithm. it, it doesn't ha- it doesn't have a uh, meat space like us. you know things that are fundamentally human. That's part of it, the advantage because it doesn't have all of these biases. So we, uh, I think there has been decades of work in this direction, but it's becoming popular recently is using these uh, optimization tools to design floor plans. So you know, traditionally, we have floor plans and they're, you know, like all our houses are kind of square, built with two by fours and, and they're, they're based on a grid layer. But if we remove that constraints, could actually get uh, very efficient houses that look really weird. <laughs> These kind of a hexagonal rooms uh, that are optimized so that the, whoever lives in that room will have a minimum distance 
to travel to every other room. And so, so I think uh, there's, a, there's a lot of potential in, in uh, combining this, uh, the creative aspects of the optimization algorithm with, with uh, practical uh, real world applications. Do you think of it as like, it generates a lot of like ideas and brainstorm stuff and then it is up to the human to like make the final call and be like, this is practical, this is like possible and to sort of curate all of the generations or ideas of the AI? For instance, uh, the, the human uh, designer would uh, their role would be to choose maybe some of the best ideas that they think are, are neat. But at the same time, they may also be involved in, in setting the constraints in the system. It's like, you, what if you come up with these solutions that are taking advantage of some bug in the physics engine? Right? Then, then that, that's not really useful. It, that, that could look like a cool arts project, but it may not be useful in, in the real world. So, so maybe the, there has to be some sort of a feedback uh, maybe the if the robot or or if the algorithm finds solutions that are too trivial, uh, then it's up to the 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 designer to to kind of plug those holes. It's kind of like a, a adversarial system in in the real world. Uh, it it kind of reminds me of a you know how like we in the Olympics we've seen in you know, in the last hundreds of years uh, there are games where the way people play certain sports have fundamentally changed because uh, of some innovation. Like maybe a hundred years ago, people would start running, standing up, but now everyone, you know, puts their head, like you know, bends over first before they, they do a sprint. So these, these innovations are, are first found by, by certain athletes. Uh, but it could be you know, like some of these innovations may, could also be found with, technology assisted tools yeah i guess like in the pro athlete scenario it's sort of similar to the like you have this game with certain constraints and then you're trying to like optimize to the very very extreme and so then you get like these little cheats that you know are kind of weird but exploit sort of the rules of the game to like you know get that last like 0.0001 percent like uh it's like an artist where you you can only have one piece of paper <laughs> you have to draw something so you, if you're only allowed to, to run one experiment tonight, you cannot try a dozen variations. Then it makes you think a lot harder what you want to try. And I think that process makes the research more like a creative and it's when innovation comes out. Yeah, building off of that, like in your own research, like could you talk a little bit about your own research and also like do you impose like resource constraints on yourself when you're, when you're doing research or like, yeah, how do you impose those constraints and do they come out in like the things that you're interested in? I have my own process in how, like everyone has, does the things that work best for them. I, I take joy in defining some task, uh, sometimes over actually trying to solve some of these tasks. I, I feel like looking at history, some some of the successful researchers I know in the past are not particularly known for their solution, but they're known for posing some important problems for, for and, and convincing others that this is a kind of an important problem to solve. Yeah. Could you go a bit, like, could you dig more or like describe more about your own research and like some of the tasks that you've enjoyed defining or like what you're working on currently? Now I'm more focused on uh, less on like a pure machine learning part. And I'm more focused on, on areas related to complex systems. In the sense that I'm, I'm excited about designing systems of many different components or agents, so to speak and having them learn to communicate with each other and somehow learn a, a coherent solution. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited about trying to uh, look at ways of encouraging uh, these swarms to have uh, self-organizing properties that can be learned and, 
and combine these approaches to solve tasks that are traditionally solved with with machine learning. And then like to contrast that with the machine learning or deep learning systems, which you, um, like they're more hierarchical. Could you say more about that? Like traditionally you could have, uh, you could have uh, a deep learning system that will take in all of the inputs in one shot and do some processing and output all of the actions it requires in, in, in another shots, right? Uh, the problem with this approach is uh, what, what if you, you suddenly have failures, uh, especially when the environment changes, like when the background changes a bit or when there's some obstacles, the agent actually, because uh, they, they're trained to only focus on what, it's, what it thinks is important. Yeah, I guess like uh, shifting gears a little bit, um, what is the larger goal or purpose behind what you're working on? I don't think I'm, I have, uh, you know, like uh, the grand goal of uh, creating an AGI <laughs> to, to kind of like take over our intelligence. But I think uh, as a byproduct of creating like simple constraint systems, it, it could be, you know, like a, a useful model for us to use on, on how to self-reflect by creating simple experiments that that explore aspects of of these uh, constraints that which may lead to intelligent behavior, it may allow me to understand a bit more about ourselves. Simulations of of human behavior, we could see where things might go wrong uh, before they go wrong, or we could also try to. Uh, like a model things that have gone wrong before and see if we can like a, like attempt to create an alternative solution to prevent something from going wrong. Oh, have you encountered people who discredit the value of creative technology? So, like Honestly, I haven't really seen people who discredit like creative technology. I hear more concerns on technology being used to, to augment the power imbalances. Uh, you know, rather than you know, technology against, hey, you shouldn't use that GAN to create this arts because uh, that's worth nothing anyway. I, I don't hear a lot of that. <laughs> yeah, do you like come across that in your own research or do you like reflect on the implications of like your own research like i'm not going to research this field because it could be used by like the government or the department of defense to do this like later on like yeah what is the sort of meta dialogue about that i certainly keep that in mind like within my own research like it's it's still fairly fundamental but uh, i i can see that if i was working on on like a computer vision or like a um, like person identification and even making others aware of this. Hey, you know, this is a new method, it's pretty cool, it can do all these things, uh, but it can enable these things from happening. So I think, you know, having that dialogue is, is quite important in the community. And, and I think uh, in, in, the, in the machine learning conference communities that I'm a part of, uh, I, I try to be a more vocal like for for instance, in, in the NeurIPS conference, uh, they introduced um, a section where the authors should uh, are encouraged to dis to discuss the social implications of the research, and I'm a proponent of that as well. I don't think that's the solution, but it's, it's still a step in the right direction. Should do you think there should be like some sort of like a system involved, or should it just be like people reflecting on their own? Ultimately, I think. Uh, by having, by clearly communicating issues and dangers around technologies uh, in a way that the general public can understand and take like a nuanced approach of looking at the issue. Uh, the more conversations we have, uh, the better. Communication that is clear, that can be understandable by 
the broad community, not just by the niche technical community is probably one of the, the most important things we can do to, to highlight uh, the, the, the pros and cons of the research. That would be fantastic if every research paper had like pros and cons listed. Yeah, well, in, as I mentioned, uh, in certain conferences like NeurIPS, uh, it is strongly encouraged. Uh, it's, it's optional because some papers that are dealing with like theory, like where you have to prove the existence of a solution, they even gave an extra page uh, of, of the paper to allow researchers to write about this stuff. So I think uh, it, it's, a, it's a good step. 